Right. Um, and then we will get started. So bear with mm -hmm. me about another 60 seconds and we will get started. Talk amongst yourselves. Talk another 60 seconds um, and we'll get started. Good to see you again, Mr. Bolivar, of course, always. Oh, good to see you, too. Uh, I uh, need to take that halo off. Uh, of course, always. <laughs> that's more appropriate. There we go. Uh, All right. Yeah. Time to get serious. My effects doesn't work. You oh. got a bit blurry oh, with them. Ah. Hmm. All right. Screw that. If I can't do the special effects, I'll do my own. That's right. You are a special effect. Oh, funny. Posting the. Uh, via chat and then then we can get started. Hmm. Let's okay. see. And this is my first my time doing all this, so I'm slow, but we'll get it. Mm -hmm. uh, put it on the website and then I will be done. I look awfully washed out, don't I? No you don't. No. Not at all. Quite lovely, like in fact. It. it looks very ghoulish. It's becoming... It's the natural mm. light from these big windows. Mm. I hate natural light. One <laughs> 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 of the children of the night, eh? Yes. What lovely music they make. Yes. <laughs> so are we live, honey? We are live now. Music they make. Yep, okay, yeah. I actually did that right. <laughs> So we are being recorded. We are okay, live. So what, Let me post what this to the... What Barbara song are we going to sing? <laughs> That's up to you. Mm. Let me push this. I bet you all uh, don't even know any Barbara Streisand songs, do you? Uh, actually, my mom's really... Or a clear day? Good. No, I don't think so. You know that one? <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know any music after 1930. Oh, no. <laughs> Of the way we were. That was her, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The light the light the corners of my mind. Yeah. Yeah. That we was are, her. darling. <laughs> well, you just read an article about Barbara Streisand, didn't you? I wrote for the Rocket. Wow. I, I wrote a um, I wrote a, a a lead a lead review, and they paid me seventy five dollars. And they got the most obnoxious cartoon of Streisand that I have ever seen to be mm. the illustration. And um, the the title of it, because I, I was reviewing her box set, the four four discs, and they said the title they gave the article was "When Too Much Is Not Enough." So they're kind of poking fun at me, but so what? I got to review Barbie Streisand. Did, did you write it as a Lovecraftian horror piece? No, did I, you I, was, I was very serious. Jessica Solomon scolded me for being too serious. Uh, I, I wanted it to be a very serious review um, and factual and just a little bit of gay boy gaga. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was fun. Okay, um, I'm seeing, I'm learning as I go, and we've got three viewers doesn't say who they are besides, well, oh, now four viewers besides uh, Hello, viewers. people that are in this room. Yes. And you're also talking to, well, I'm, we're all also talking to anyone till the end of time who is watching this recorded. Okay. So five viewers. So, okay. Um, now, are they watching They're watching, they are it, watching, it, on watching it on YouTube. On YouTube? Okay. Yes, and they are. At the evening as well, or? Yes, actually, I just posted the YouTube link at the easing, ah. so that they can actually just go to the easing, click the play button, and watch it. So it's so everything nice. we say will be recorded until the stars go dead and the earth immortalized. Is That's right. Hello, world. So, <laughs> so this is Mike Davis. We're this is the Lovecraft easing chat, first official one, and we're chatting with author. Sorry, who? Oh, right. W.H. Pugmire. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we? <laughs> and, uh, and we're pretty informal. Um, I guess my question would be for Willem is, what's he got upcoming going on right now? And and uh, then we can just take it from there. Um, Whatever Willem wants to chat about. Oh, let's see. I'm, I'm almost finished writing my newest book. 
I told myself I wasn't going to write books for three years. And whenever I say that, then I immediately begin working on the next three books. And that's kind of what happened. Um, actually, what happened was um, Necronomicon Providence 2013, the um, Providence Convention celebrating H.P. Lovecraft and Providence was announced. And my immediate reaction was, I have to write a book that will see its debut at that convention. And um, I'm almost finished with it. It's going to be a short book, probably 55 or 60,000 words. Um, there'll be four brand new Sesquil Valley novelettes, and then a um, um, prose poem sequence, and then as Opening, I'm using the uh, prose poem I wrote for uh, Robert Nelson that Mike published in the easing. That was so that's great, what I'm doing uh, now. And I still have two books coming out. The, the, um, the Strange Dark One, Tales of Nair Lahotep, coming out in October from Miskatonic River Press. And then I co-wrote a book of all new stories with Jeffrey Thomas, and that's called Encounters with Enoch Coffin. And that will be out early next year in hardcover from Dark Regions Press. So, so, so it's, uh, I, if you want Willem to write, just tell him to stop writing for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I might as well just keep doing it because my, my fear was that I was writing too many books. Because I, um, I'm a bit of a drama queen, had some health issues. I was certain that I was going to die last year of, of a heart attack. So I said, I can't die until I've um, written some more books. So I, I, I wrote new books and assembled new books. I wrote Some Unknown Gulf of Night in six weeks. Um, and um, but all of a sudden I, I had all these books coming out competing with each other and I said this is crazy who can afford all these books um, so I thought okay you really have to slow down so just don't write for two years I thought it would be easy and not writing has proven extremely difficult so I surrender and, um, I don't think you can write too many books, as long as they're good books, which they are, I'm sure. Well, we we shall see. It's um, this I I wanted this this new book. Um, it's called Bohemians of Sesqua Valley. So it'll um I I wanted it to be totally clue mythos. And so I've um I've written my definitive story about Shub Nagura. And I'm right now writing a definitive story about it's, it's linked to Call of Khufu. And um, I never thought I would write such a story, but I'm having fun with it. So, so it's going to be, you know, Lovecraftian to the core, my God. <laughs> Does um, Willem look uh, fuzzy to anyone else? He um, looks uh, slightly funny, fuzzy yeah, on I occasion, think but not all the time. Um, he's, got, he's got sort of a halo oh, around him. He's a, no, I, you're fuzzy. No, you're not. I'm I think we. To, um, I think it happens when you get extremely close. I think that's, that's what it is. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Closer right. than that, if you know. Yeah, it's that kind of going from the far ground to the foreground kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, if you guys have questions for Willem ask because you know also if you're watching this what it looks like starting getting starting to get quite a few people watching this if you have a question you can send me an instant message and I will I will ask well so I, you guys have I, I thought of a question well yeah. this is sort of a vague question but um, what is it do you think that it is about Lovecraft that inspires such fanaticism because there, there are a lot of good writers, and there are a lot of writers with good ideas, but people seem to follow Lovecraft with an almost religious devotion. Like, what, what is so special about Lovecraft, do you think? 
I can only answer for myself, and it's that he's intoxicating. He's original. He's damn good, and um, he he just kind of he grabs you by the tentacles. That's what happened to me. I became obsessed with him not just from reading the fiction, but in the early 70s when I when I became a Lovecraft fanboy. I um I was buying all these Arkham House books and I ordered the selected letters. And that revealed an entirely new and delightful Lovecraft to me because he's playful, humorous and wonderful in his letters. Also, you know, he's also, you know, racist and all that ugly stuff, but he he charmed me. He, his personality as it was expressed in his letters totally charmed me. And um Yeah, I think, I, think I, the you know, I, I I read his personality too as well as his writing. He's just you know, he just he's he's fascinating. His fiction was like nothing I had ever read. And um and then it, it was it was also the entire mythos thing because at the same time I was discovering Lovecraft, I did, I read um Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos and Lynn Carter's book, and it was just, it, it was just this entire, it seemed like this entire family of writers who were having so much fun, and they were inventing these gods, and, and, it, and the way that Lynn Carter wrote about it, he made it sound delicious, and I wanted to be a part of it. So it, 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 it's not just Lovecraft, it's the entire being part of a, a tradition that is really cool, really fun, and um, that's what it was for me. But I'm, I, as I grow older, I become more obsessed with Lovecraft because every time I read him, I, I just it excites me. He thrills me. His fiction yeah. thrills me. You never me. get tired of him, huh? I, I'm, weird. I, I'm reading him all the time. That's why I have to. I have to own. So many different editions of Lovecraft, so that I, I don't get bored reading the same book. I'll okay, now I'm going to read it in this book, and then I'll read him in that book. And <laughs> one for every day of the week. Huh? But every time I return to him, I find different things, and and now I don't just read him. I I study him so that I can, you know, use elements of his fiction in my own fiction. So I, I'm you know and and. And I love I love um, literary scholarship, and I'll be reading a book of Lovecraft scholarship, and that will really excite me, and that will give me ideas for stories. It's just it's just he feed, Lovecraft feeds me absolutely in every way as an as an artist and as a fan. Yeah, for for someone who only lived forty six years, you sure left behind a lot. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. As something you said just now, Willem, um, you know, as a writer and a reader, I would imagine, um, you know, when when you're writing your stuff, if you're whoever, that's that's your mythology. When you're writing Lovecraft stuff, you've automatically got all these other people, readers, writers that you identify with and that are sharing this with you. Mm-hmm. you know, so. Yeah. But I, it's... Someone sent me... Mark Ryan says he's in bed and doesn't want to join the chat because he thinks he looks bad. Mark, so I, to- I told him, "Have you seen my picture?" So, girlfriend, come on, Mark. He's got a question. Um, well, first of all, he says it's awesome seeing other people who share my level of fanaticism, and then he wants to ask Willem if he's ever spoken to Lovecraft in his dreams. So, that's Mark's question. Um, no, I. I don't even I don't remember ever having dreamed about Lovecraft, which seems almost scandalous to have to confess that. Um, my dreams are usually extremely depressing. They're usually about jobs that I have held, and nothing is working right, and um, it's the nightmares of my past. I rarely I'm going to sneeze. 
I rarely dream about my writing life. Um, I also have, I always have recurring dreams about being buddies with Elton John and Barbara Streisand, like I'm going to Barbara Streisand's house and having dinner, and I'm trying to be on my best behavior because she <laughs> has a bit of, you know, she's so, she's so picky. Um, but I've never dreamed about Lovecraft. I've, I've, I've dreamed about aspects of his fiction, um, but my memory of those dreams are very vague. But, and, and usually I have those dreams when I'm working on, when, when, I'm, like when I'm studying The Hound to write a sequel to it. And then I, I have a lot of dreams about The Hound and what I want to use from it. Um, oh, and that's part of my writing process, is dreaming my ideas and dreaming Lovecraft's stories. And then when I go to write those stories, I remember the dreams. And instead of feeling like dreams, they feel like memories of something that happened to me. And it's just a really cool thing. Yeah. To use as a writer. Well, well instead of dreaming, maybe ahead. you feel his presence at all sometimes. It mm -hmm. almost feels like I think all of us do in some way. Kind of looking over your shoulder. I the 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 one time I felt Lovecraft's presence was when I was standing in front of Ten Barn Street with S. T. Joshi, and um, it it. S.T. was right beside me, and he was he was almost like chanting the titles of everything that Lovecraft had written when he lived at that address. <laughs> he was summoning him, and I and I totally I felt I felt his presence there. I didn't feel it at Swan Point, um, but I, I I felt it, and um, I felt it so powerfully that I, I had to go and touch the house, you know, and it, and it was like. It was kind of like embracing Lovecraft's face. I just had to touch it. And that's the only time where I've been overwhelmed with the presence of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, it was the most thrilling day of my life. And it's when I, I vowed that I will always be writing Lovecraftian weird fiction to pay homage to him and his genius. I have a question from one of our artists, and I hesitate to say his name because um, I know I'm going to get it wrong, but it's, uh, let me pull it up here, it's Stejapan, S-T-E-S-T-J-E-P-A-N. I'm sorry, man, we talk on email all the time, but I've never had to say your name before. But his question is, uh, for, for Willem, is if Lovecraft could return from the dead to our modern time for just one day, where would you take him to? What would you show him? And I would add to that question, what would you, um, what would you uh, guess talk about or what would you want to say to him? Well, the only place I can imagine him returning to would be Providence. And for me... Um, the most magical thing that could ever happen to me would be to walk the streets of Providence in moonlight with H.P. Lovecraft, to go to St. John's Churchyard and and speak of Poe. Um, I wouldn't be asking him questions about, were you serious when you wrote The Hound, or is it parody, or anything like that. I would just... I would in, enjoy the magic of his company, and and just try to let him know spiritually how much I love him and how much he he has rewarded me. The mm. gift of Lovecraft has been immense in my life. So I would try to convey that with my eyes, <laughs> maybe with my lips. <laughs> There's a lot more ice cream flavors now than there were then too. Mm. Yeah, I could find out if he was actually a closet gay. 
But, um, yeah. yeah, that's something I've always wondered about. It would about. take a lot of courage to ask him that to his face. <laughs> he would never admit it, but <laughs> no, no, he I did love the boys. Well, yeah. No, I, I, he may don't, not. I don't. I I do not think that Lovecraft was gay. Um, it, but his homophobia seems to be centered around feminine men. He didn't like swishes. He didn't like queens. <laughs> and, um, but he liked manly men. And you can see that in, in his fiction. He's often describing men who are strong and handsome. And um, so who knows? But I think he probably was really asexual, and maybe he gravitated towards the company of men. Yeah. The, the other thing he liked, I noticed, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Will, but I noticed, you know, none of his characters ever really have to worry about money. They've, all, right. you know, they've either been left um, a sum of money so they don't have to work, or you know, so they can just sit around and read, which is. Like I, you know, I often, probably. As a writer, I often worry about that because nobody in Sesquiwa Valley seems to have a job. <laughs> and I'm like, right. What, how do these people exist? But that is so boring. Who wants to write about it? You know, I, it's, it's like it's, it's not important to the crux of, of storytelling. It's, right. it's a tedious little um, facet of, of their lives that has nothing to do with the story you're telling of them. So you just ignore it. I ignore it. Yeah. Usually. I, I think he said specifically he didn't like writing about the sort of mundane everyday things. So mm -hmm. We just assume they're all they all have like inherited wealth or something, I guess. And he didn't like writing about the common man um, and his his women characters were, I th I think he I think this is part of for me this is part of Lovecraft's genius his creation of Lavinia Waitley. That character has depths, has mysteries and intrigues, which are hinted at to the point where where you could write a novel about Lavinia Waitley just based on the hints that Lovecraft. Has given you of her, of her life. Um, you can explore her childhood being raised um, by her grandfather, and <clears throat> and then the the mystery and the tragedy of her death. It's there's a whole novel in that single slight character in the Dunwich Horror, and this is this is part of. Lovecraft can create a universe with with just a line, with just a single character, with just an idea. And for me, that is part of Lovecraft's genius. Here, here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yay. <laughs> you know, when I talked to you the other day, well, and I said, you know, what what do you want? What do you want to talk about? And I, I remember the very first thing you said. Uh, if I remember correctly, was you know what Lovecraft means to you, and and I you've said several times lately. And I saw in your video last night with with S T Joshi that um, today is the best time you Absolutely. think there ever was to be a Lovecraftian. So I, can yeah. I talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I've been a Lovecraftian for what forty years now, and it it, it never gets old. But now we have. So much. When I first became a Lovecraftian, it was the early 1970s. Um, Derelict had just died, and that started a whole new branch of scholarship, uh, with, mostly with Dirk Mosig. We have the excellent um, journal Nyctalops, or Nyctalops, however you pronounce that, um, that many of the old correspondence of Lovecraft were writing for that magazine and um, it it was just a, a it was a wonderful time but there was a lot of friction and then Sprague de Camp wrote his biography and that created such hostility between different people and that's when I dropped out of Lovecraft fandom because there was so much hostility 
And, um, but, you know, over, over, over time, Lovecraft just doesn't get away. He gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and now, I have this really very intimate, it feels very intimate and personal relationship with Lovecraft as an artist. And he has given me, I feel, my life as an artist. But <clears throat> there's so many other things that contribute to that. There is having S.T. Joshi live here in Seattle is like, oh, my God. You know, it's, it's I, I couldn't imagine because he's, he is the world's leading Lovecraft scholar. So that is a special gift, and that just really excites me having him here last night and we were able to discuss, you know, the the legality of his Lovecraft text and and and, you know, who who can use them and all that stuff. It was just, you know, um it's it's wonderful. But there's you know, we have so many books. We have the the published letters of Lovecraft coming more and more, um, mostly from Hippocampus Press, they're about to publish two volumes of the joint correspondence of Clark, Ashton, Smith, and, and Lovecraft. It's going to be amazing. Um, we have scholars who really um, are very keenly intelligent and original in presenting aspects of Lovecraft's work. Um, we have more professional editors um, bringing out anthologies like Love, um, Lovecraft Unbound by Ellen Datlow and ST's Black Wings. I've been reading Black Wings too, and um, it's great. And then you know, here's here's ST's new book, which is just amazing. This is his uh, pictorial history. Of Lovecraft. It's called H.P. Lovecraft Nightmare Countries. Yeah, I really want to it's, want it's, a copy of that. Wow. Me too. Yeah. You know what? It's like Did we it? have all we ha we have so much richness now as Lovecraftians. There is this is 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 never ending. We you know here in the Northwest we have the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. We're going to have the Providence Convention next year. Um, we had MythosCon last year in um, Phoenix, Arizona, which was an amazing experience. I, I met I met so many people that I've been corresponding with for 40 years that I've never met. It's just a it's a really rich, rewarding time. Yeah, the Necronomicon is next is August 2013, which you will be there. I will yes. be there. Joshi will be there. Um, isn't that right? Right. A lot of people will be there. Yeah. Everybody, you know, all, all the all the major Lovecraft scholars, I think, will be there. Uh, Laird Barron will be there. Caitlin Kiernan will be there. Uh, it, it's it's going to be stunning. It is going to be the most amazing collection of Lovecraftian souls of all time. Yeah, so if you're watching this either live or, or, or whenever later, you got plenty of time to save for <laughs> Necronomicon August 2013. We're mm -hmm. all going to be there. Derek, you got to go right there. I know, Don't it's wait. right in town. <laughs> Ju Julia can drive there. She's very yeah. close. <laughs> She'll drive her Zeppelin. Yes. <laughs> So I'll have I want to, to learn to teleport, quite frankly. That's the only way I'll make it. Yeah. <laughs> that would be an amazing trick. If you learn, teach me. <laughs> I want to hear what Lovecraft means to y'all. I'd like to not just concentrate on, on, on my relationship with Lovecraft, but just, you know, even if, it's, even if it's briefly, just tell me what holds your interest in Lovecraft. Why are you here talking to me tonight? Let's, let's do that, and I'll go last. I'll let you guys, before we do that, let me say to anybody watching this, um, in... In August, the guys from HP Podcraft have agreed to do one of these special video chat interviews. So they'll be here. They'll chat and uh, if I run out of strikes again, I can't remember both their names. 
but uh, they're great guys, and they really uh, brought a lot to to Lovecraft, and their podcast is great. And then, um, no promises, of course, but uh, you know, I've asked Willem if next time St comes around, we'll con him into fifteen or twenty minutes of this, and yeah, and he'll probably stay, stay here for an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. So if if that ever happens, I will announce it in plenty of time. So. Um, Wanted to say that. So anyway, yeah, what does Lovecraft mean to you guys? Willem wants to know. <laughs> Anyone want to go first? Yeah. Well, why not you? Me, yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know, I, I think I remember quite clearly being uh, 12 years old and uh, walking through the bookstore and, and happening upon this paperback book. It was uh, on the used book section and it had this skeleton with a, a cloak, its arms outstretched and I was thinking to myself, well, that's pretty cool, you know? <laughs> I, what is this? So it was the first book I ever picked up. It was um, In the Mountains of Madness uh, by H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and, you know, I, I had never been much of a prolific reader before that. I mean, I read comic books, that sort of thing. And when I really dug into uh, Mountains of Madness, I mean, it, it set off like an explosion in my mind. I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. It was this, this inspiring, uh, you know, horrible new universe, you know, where there's these bright, dark corners, you know, as, as uh, much of a dichotomy as that sounds, with cubes and cones and albino penguins and horrible monsters. <laughs> and, you know, it really spurred me to to start reading, to actually start writing. I wrote my first, I guess, Lovecraftian fan fiction after that, you know, and as an aspiring writer now, I I think I owe Lovecraft all of that. I mean, with one book, he set me down that path, and I never looked back. Excellent. Mm. Well, I'd like to go next, if I may. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um... My Aunt Margaret gave me a book called Great Tales of Terror and the Supernatural. And uh, Lovecraft had two stories at the very back. Um, The rats in the wall sounded too frightening to me because I was a bit frightened of rats back then. So I went on to the Dunwich Horror and it frightened me so badly I was literally in a fever for four days, complete with fever dreams. Um, I was trapped up on Sentinel Hill. I could not get away. And when I finally did manage to get away, the fever was gone and I was okay. But after that, I was completely nuts about H.P. Lovecraft. Don't ask me why. Um, Yes, that feeling of being close to other worlds is one thing that I get from him. I don't know if I ever got it from anything before, possibly from Jules Verne's Journey to the Centre of the Earth, but but even that is mundane next to Lovecraft, because with Lovecraft you journey to the centre of the universe, you journey to the centre of chaos, you know, the beginning of time, the end of time. Um, he opened my horizons in a way that nobody else ever did. He expanded my vocabulary in a way that nobody else mm-hmm. ever did. Jealous. I've always loved words. Even as a little kid, I was trying out these new long words that I was coming up with in books and usually pronouncing them wrong. And with Lovecraft, I found somebody else who shared my love. I mean, he can... Paleogean megalopolis. (laughs) Where else would you find words like that, both of them together? He wasn't afraid of them. He wasn't afraid of being misunderstood. You know, he was just... He unashamedly loved certain things and he went with them and he followed them. Um, I love the way he avoids the mundane. I mean, I live in the mundane world. I have to do things like housework and budget and, you know, cook and... Oh, I've kind of run out of steam now. Like, Mike, I've also got fibromyalgia, so I tend to forget what I'm saying halfway through saying it. Well, for those of you that don't know, Julia Mm. um, records an awful lot of Lovecraftian stories, some of Willem's stories, and, uh, you know, she's got a great reading voice. They're really great to listen to. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, you know, just Google Morgan Scorpion and YouTube, and you'll find her channel, and, you know, subscribe. And you'll mm-hmm. get an email every time she 
doesn't know it. Right now you're doing uh, supernatural horror and literature. So that's, that's right, that's yes, yes. Well, isn't that so, a brilliant idea, Julia? Well, I, uh, I asked a few people on Facebook, and they said, yeah, go for it. So, um, yeah. It's some of his best writing. Um, I was surprised. Um, there's a difference between, between reading it, you know, on, on, on the book, between listening to it, and between saying the words yourself. And I, I think when you come to read something out loud yourself, you get a, a, a deeper level of appreciation for it. Um, That's true. Yes. Did, did you see um, that? Did, did you see that Ask Lovecraft highlighted one of your oh, videos on his channel? I'm thrilled to bits. That man is a genius. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> I, w I wish he could have been here tonight. Um, yeah. I think it's the closest we'll ever get to actually meeting H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. To be honest, if I might um, carry on for a bit longer, um, no, go ahead. I would love to meet Lovecraft, but I would be afraid to as well. Um, um, I strongly think he wouldn't approve of me. Uh, he never um, expressed, um, he, didn't, he never spoke about women very much at all, but I, I got a very strong feeling I was not the kind of woman his aunts would like him to talk to. Um, well, I you hope could probably all agree that he probably wouldn't, may not approve of any of us, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> speak for yourself. I think whoever wants well, to start yeah, talking... Yeah, about, he had, about books, uh, he, about Poe, He had a variety of women correspondents of mm. all different kinds. He, there was a woman poet who was married to a black man, uh -huh. and, I, and I believe that Lovecraft knew that she was married to a, a black mm. man, and yet he was extremely cordial to her, and they had a... He had a lot of freaky friends. Yeah, really? I mean... Maybe his aunts wouldn't approve of you, but he... I, I, so, I sometimes wonder if maybe we paint Lovecraft as far more uptight than he actually was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're you know, Julia right. said something a minute ago that, uh, you know, that Lovecraft bringing you out of, of the mundane. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys have read... Um, uh, Michael, or I, I guess it's Michael Holbrook. I'm not sure yeah. if I'm saying that right. Against the World, Against Life, H.P. Mm -hmm. Lovecraft. You know, one of the, uh, I pulled it up here. Life is, he, this is him writing, Life is painful and disappointing. It is useless, therefore, to write new realistic novels. We generally know we, where we stand in relation to reality, and we mm -hmm. don't care to know any more. Um, now here is Howard Phillips Lovecraft. He's quoting Lovecraft now. I am so beastly tired of mankind and the world that nothing can interest me unless it contains a couple of murders on each page or deals with the horrors unnameable and accountable that leer down from the external universes. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's as far as the mundane you can get. <laughs> mm. That's a great book, by the way. Uh, and it's not very long. It's a good read. I was less thrilled with it. Like I, I haven't read it, so I don't know. I didn't feel he truly, I, I didn't really feel that he, he knew Lovecraft very well at all. I think um, he bought so much into the antisocial recluse thing that he totally failed to notice how very sociable Lovecraft was, how benevolent he was towards the people he met, how helpful he was towards the correspondents. I think, although Lovecraft was certainly prone to bouts of depression and negativity, he was actually a very positive person. You just have to look at his effect upon other people, how many people he inspired to write, how many people he encouraged whilst he was alive. Um, well, yeah, I think that when people um, think of the, the word misanthropic, you know, there's mm -hmm. misanthropes that hate everybody, and then there's misanthropes mm -hmm. that are just loners. You know, so. I think he was complicated, and everybody sees this on an aspect of him it's kind of like the blind men and the elephant. You know, everyone says, oh, he was like this, and someone else says, yes. oh, no, he was like this. And, but he was all those things and, and probably a lot more. How did you get into Lovecraft, Adam? Oh, me? Well, uh, I, it was sort of, it was inevitable, I, really. Um, I was Lovecraftian before I even heard of him. Uh, I actually didn't discover him until fairly late. Uh, but I've always been into the antique. Like, I... Uh, 
collected antique clothes from the 1910s and 20s, uh, like stiff collars and spats and old books and old typewriters, and I'd type on, like, antique typewriters, and, you know, I, I like to imagine I lived in another time. And uh, I think a friend of mine told me, oh, you, you look like an H.P. Lovecraft character, and that was the first time I'd ever heard the name. And it sort of just, you know... It, it, it just was meant to be. Like I found his books and I started reading them, and he kind of got into my head, it, like kind of like invasion of the body snatchers. You know, I, it's like he found me in a way. Mm -hmm. So I actually think he would have liked me. I think he would have liked all of us, though. I mean, in different ways. But I would love to have hung out with him. You know, mm -hmm. go to go down to the to the beach with him, or go down <laughs> eat some ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> Just just spend the day with them. I think that would have been lovely. And I think, uh, you know, but, you know I, I think feel we would have got on famously. But when, when I read his correspondence, and sometimes when I'm even reading his fiction, I do feel that I'm hanging out with him. Mm. Really? Yeah, totally. His tone has such a personal touch. And he doesn't, he's not afraid to say anything about himself, what he feels, what he thinks. Um, his passions are naked, and he just, he's, he's totally there. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, when I'm reading his correspondence especially, I really feel his presence, you know. So, I, so we can. Well, um, we can I think uh, I like his letters most of all because I can just read them over and over again, and I feel like he's with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm never lonely when I'm reading his letters. <laughs> well. Willem, can you do me a, a favor? Assume that uh, someone watching this has never read any of your books, and maybe just briefly talk a little bit about Susquehanna Valley and why you created it and, and what it is in relation to Lovecraft and, and so forth. Um, I wanted to start writing. It, it, I I became obsessed with the Clue Mythos from reading um, Tales of the Clue Mythos and Lynn Carter's book on Lovecraft, and I decided I had to become a part of this fan club. It seemed like a fan club to me. Anyone could join. You just have to invent your 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 own great old one and um, your own special forbidden book. And then I was I, I either read an interview with Ramsey Campbell or I read something. Maybe it was maybe this was in Lynn Carter's book where where Ramsey originally set his stories in Dunwich and Arkham and Innsmouth and Derelict said don't don't set your stories in Lovecraft's New England set them in your own land your own country um, invent your own British version of Arkham and Innsmouth and um, so when I was a kid, I used to spend two weeks every summer visiting my relatives in Mount, in North Bend. And I was hypnotized by Mount Si, the Twin Peak Mountain. And that's the area where um, David Lynch used that for Twin Peaks. And so when I, when I decided to start writing my own mythos fiction, I knew that I was going to invent my own locality, and it would be based on North Bend. And um, and when I first began writing it, it I just wanted it was just going to be a, a cool place where I could write about groovy mythos monsters. But over time, it has evolved because I'm not really interested in writing about gigantic monsters. And although I do sometimes, but um, <clears throat> I, I, I like writing about outsiders and freaks mm -hmm. and, and people who like to embrace the horror instead of shunning it, and th that was my own personal approach. And Sesquil Valley has been really great for that because it is a supernatural valley um, with its own special race, like the Deep Ones of Innsmouth. Um, this is a race that have wandered 
from a shadow land that is adjacent to the valley. And uh, it's just, it, it continues to grow. The book I'm, I'm writing now that I'm almost completely um, finished with, um, I've been able to investigate more and more um, aspects of Sesquil Valley. And it, there's just so much. It's so deep. And there's still so much I can write about it. I think it, it's um, it's like I, I, I was reading um, the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, and at one point Lovecraft mentions that there's two two points where the the woodland of Earth connects with the forest of the Dreamlands, and I immediately thought one of those places is going to be Sesquil Valley, mm -hmm. and and that's why Sesquil Valley is sometimes visited by night guns. And that's why Nair Lahotep is like a next door neighbor because <laughs> he is. And um, there's it's you know, just, this place is music too loud, I'm guessing. Yeah. It's it was it's it's a <laughs> it, it's it's an intensely rich invention. And and the more I work with it, the more I see the possibilities. So uh I, I shall be writing tales of Sesco Valley until I die. Where should um, the first time... Maybe that's where you'll end up after you die. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. Where should the first time what W.H. Pugmire reader, um, what, what book should they start with? Oh, dear. Do you think? See, I want you to start with my best, but my most popular... I, I'm kind of astounded. I... I brought my books out just to just to, cause I was thought well I'm going to talk about them I might as well show them and it's like I kind of can't believe how many books I've written I mean look at all these that's kind of you see that's a lot of books oh wow um to me this is my best book but this is not a Cisco Valley book this is um, a series of prose poems and vignettes based on Lovecraft's fungi from Yuggas. And, um, but I... Which one was that one? In case That was Some Unknown Gulf of Night. Right. My most popular book is probably Sesquil Valley and Other Haunts. The glare is really bad here. Um, this is the hardcover edition. The paperback edition was published by Mythos Books. And this seems, it's early work, so it kind of embarrasses me. But, because when I wrote these stories for this book, I was my own editor. And I, I, I suffered from grammatical anarchy because I thought it was cool and Lovecraftian. Whereas, actually it was just me being an amateur. And um, when S.T. Joshi became my editor, he cured me of that. So there's there's a lot of bad writing in this book, but these are the my first real definitive stories as a Lovecraftian, I think. And um, so probably Sesqua Valley and Other Haunts is is the uh, book to begin with. My, you know, my mother. My mother is grumbling. What mother? Let's, let's, we'll, eat, we'll eat dinner at five o'clock, okay? Well, nobody's coming, mother. Mother, <laughs> mother, <laughs> the blood, mother, mother. You, you let us know when you need to go, well. Mother, mm. mother wants me to shut up. She says I've been talking, <laughs> and I'm going to wear out my voice. Mother, I am a windbag. I have sufficient... <laughs> Amen, is that what you said, bitch? Hello. Anyway, um, <laughs> Mother and I have a very special relationship, as you can tell. Um, so, we'll eat at 5 o'clock, okay, Mom? No one's coming in. No one will be here until 6 o'clock. And then everyone will be here. Your caregiver comes, okay? 
So we have, lovely, if you need to, we have a lovely if you dinner need to go. at 6 o'clock. All right. This is... Um, Let's see. So, um, Cisco Valley and Other Haunts um, was published in paperback by Mythos Books. And um, it, it has been my most popular book, and it might be the best one to begin with. Um, but then they all get better from then on. <laughs> I, I've um, writing with it, working with S. T. Joshi as my editor made me. It, it fills me with a desire to improve as a writer and to do my very, very best because I esteem him so much. And it has always been. It was long a fantasy of mine to have S.T. Joshi admire my work. And so I thought, well, the best way for that to happen is to, to just really make the effort to write extremely well. And um, so he's been a wonderful influence on my, on my growth as a writer because I, um, since he's, he, the first book, I worked on with him was my first hippocampus book, The Fungal Stain. And um, he, he, that was, that was my first time having an actual editor for a book of my own. And it, it completely changed the way I approach writing. It made me very serious and adult. Um, I still have a lot of fun writing mythos fiction, and I think you need to keep that element of fun. Um, that element was there in the beginning when Lovecraft was writing, and and the others like Robert Block and August Derleth were um, writing stories in the Lovecraft tradition. It, it, they were, it was serious fun, and writing mythos fiction can still be, and should be, serious fun. Um, I don't like comical stories of the mythos. I don't like stories that hint that we cannot take Lovecraft or his inventions seriously. So let's let's put Cthulhu in tennis shoes or whatever people do. You know, it's um, yeah. yeah, that's become pretty popular these days. It's like no, it's like Cthulhu is a. Joke it, out of it. You know, Cthulhu is a serious, he was, it was a serious invention of Lovecraft. That was Lovecraft trying to create an entity that was truly cosmic. Um, Lovecraft didn't always succeed. Sometimes he failed miserably, but he was always serious in his attempt. And he usually got it right, as far as I'm concerned. What do you say to those people that that there there's people that have the critique that um, a writer that m only or mostly sticks to Lovecraft can't be taken as seriously, which, as you know, I don't agree with. But I, what do you I've, say to that? Yeah. I've had that paranoid for a long time. I've always, for the past 20 years, felt that I wasn't taken seriously as a professional by other professionals in the genre, in fantasy, horror, and science fiction, because I was writing, I was still writing Lovecraft fiction, and I, I had this idea that for most people, writing Lovecraft fiction was a phase that you pass through on your way to maturity as an artist, and and the little punk rocker in me said, you know, screw that, I'm going to be <laughs> Lovecraft. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be Lovecraft up the ass, and no one is going to tell me to do otherwise, and if you don't like it, you can just not read my book. You know, it was very, you know, you know, sawed off. I'm doing it my way, baby, and I'm going to be Lovecraft to the core, and if you don't like it, that's your problem. <laughs> now, I was very defiant, and I'm still, but, it, but it, it, it gave me this, I think sometimes that we punk rockers have a persecution complex. In that we, you know, it's when I first became a punk rocker, I got so much abuse from here in Seattle. They had never seen punk rockers before, and 
and I got so much abuse, and I began to ex expect that abuse. And I think that carried on um, in my becoming a Lovecraftian writer, where I, I expected not to be taken seriously because everyone was looking at me as a Lovecraft fanboy. Oh, that's the guy that's still writing Lovecraft. Oh, you know, what a joke. Well, you know... I don't, I don't know if that was actually true, if people actually thought that, but that was my, my inner paranoia, was mm -hmm. that people can't take me seriously. But, well, you know, at the same painters, time... Painters have school. I, I, was dressing, I was dressing like this as well. And so maybe that was part of the reason why people weren't taking me seriously as a writer, because they're going, what the hell is this freak all about? And they couldn't. It, it was like somebody that dresses in punk drag um, cannot be taken seriously as, as a writer, because how can that freak have, have anything serious to contribute to the genre? Look at the way he dresses. And um, so, you know, and that's a very punk rock thing. You know, when, we, when, I, when I work at a job, if I get a job as a dishwasher, I become the best dishwasher they have ever had because I have mm. to prove that, yeah, I may be a freak, but I'm a damn good worker. Mm. And I feel I've had to prove that as a, as a writer, that, yeah, I write Lovecraftian horror, but I do it damn well, so screw you. That's, mm. So that's my little thing. <laughs> I no longer I no longer feel I feel now that um, I'm pretty well acknowledged as a good writer and um, and as a good Lovecraftian writer and that has been my goal that I I want my goal as an artist to be linked with Lovecraft I want when people think of W H Pugmire I want them to think of H P Lovecraft. I want to be conjoined with him, and I want them to say, you know, he wrote, he was obsessed with Lovecraft, but he did it in his, he did it his own way, and and it has, it is is worthwhile. Mm. I, I'm not wasting my time. Mother has just turned on the telly. <laughs> I may have to take the controls away from her. Uh, like I said, you let us know when you have to go. But um, uh, what you just let's go for another ten minutes, and okay. then he's getting anxious about dinner and things. So no problem. Yeah. Um, Adam, you were going to say something. Oh well, yeah. Well, I there's this there's this uh, ugly word that's bandied about pastiche, uh, <laughs> which I it's used it's it's meant badly, but I think. Um, I think it can. I think it can be done well, and it can be done badly. I think. Mm. I think you can write like Lovecraft and do it badly, and a lot of people do, and that's why it has such a bad reputation. But well, I think you've proven that it can be done very, very well. I don't. I don't. Uh, to me, writing pastiche is trying to write in the voice of another yeah. writer, and I've never consciously tried to write like Lovecraft in his voice. Um, and yet he has he has completely affected the way I write, but so has Henry James. I, I my my prose style is far more influenced by Henry James than it is by H. P. Lovecraft. Some of the worst but, um, um, so submissions for, that I get. So for me, get. pastiche. pastiche um, I'm not, I I don't see myself as writing pastiche. Many other people do, and many people have said that I write just like Lovecraft, which always kind of annoys me because I'm, mm. I'm not trying for that. I think what they see is that Lovecraft was a very literary writer, and mm. I write in a very literary style. Um, m my style is a bit antiquated, Victorian. It's high literature. It's very poetic. Um, I'm... I'm obsessed with writing as a form of art. Lovecraft was also, Lovecraft saw himself absolutely as an artist. Um, he saw himself as a failed artist, but he was so dead serious about trying to write literature that was art and that was good. And I try to do the same thing. So maybe in that way I write like Lovecraft. But I never try to analyze his prose style and then duplicate it. I, I did it one time 
when I wrote the sequel to The Hound, I, I began that story trying to write because it, it was it was narrated, narrated by the same person that narrated Lovecraft's story. So I thought, okay, I have to make the narration sound like Lovecraft's narrator. But then I just said, you know, screw that. I don't have to do that. I'll just make make this woman my own creation and and I won't worry about making her sound like Lovecraft's narrator. Just well, I think if I, I remember just, correctly, just, yeah, just the fact that was that the I very made, first story you gave me, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And just the fact that I made the narrator a woman, you know, changes it absolutely anyway. So Yeah. I, so, well, one of the great things about Lovecraft is how inclusive he is. Uh, most people, when they have ideas, they're very jealous about guarding them. They're like, you know, this is copyrighted. Don't steal from me. You know, it's a franchise. Mm -hmm. But Lovecraft mm -hmm. is the exact opposite. He encourages people to write, to use his ideas and generous. use them. And I think that's partly why he's, he's like, survived so long and why he's, I mean, here we all are. We're still writing stories using the seeds that yeah. he, it was, he it, was a shared, it was a shared world. Mm -hmm. they, they, they took from each other and they gave to each other. And, and the sharing continues. I, 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 feel, I, I feel that I've taken a lot from Lovecraft. I've used many of his props, his characters, but I feel that I've given back as much as I've taken. So, and I think that I, we're writers can go wrong, I, I see, obviously, some really great submissions and some really bad ones, too. And right. I think when I see the bad ones, they, they are not using Lovecraft's ideas as much as they're trying to copy or be Lovecraft. And it's, it's two totally different things. You know, many, what people, is, many people think they're writing Lovecraftian fiction, but they're actually... They're, they're writing things that are they're inspired more by Brian Lumley or, or, or August Derleth. And, mm -hmm. um, and it has actually nothing to do with what Lovecraft is writing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's very true of young, new mythos writers. Um, they're, I think they're far more influenced by Derleth than by Lovecraft, and it's unfortunate. Yes, Cthulhu oh, is not... Or the monsters that Lovecraft created are not, it's not a good versus evil thing, which is what mm. Derleth tried to, to make right. it into. Right, he tried to make him into Godzilla. Yeah. Right, yeah. And, you know, if you get a strong enough good monster or good god, then you can beat the, the bad god, and that's not what Lovecraft is really about. No. In my opinion. Yeah. You know, but... I mean, for for me, the the greatest monsters of Lovecraft are are freaks like like Joseph Curran, and um, mm. they're um, and and that's been really influential to me is making the monsters freakish humans who who are definitely definitely evil. When I created Simon Gregory Williams, I said, okay, this guy is going to be badass, evil. To the core, and um, and that was and he was my monster. Instead of creating some gigantic monster with tentacles and things like that, I I, I invented this character who is a mm. monster. As an athlete. But, but in my in my new book, I I have actually given him a soul that I, that I never expected to give. I never expected to show his vulnerability, his weaknesses, um, his, his aches. And, and um, it's been really interesting writing this new book because I'm investigating aspects of Sesquil Valley and its denizens that I never thought I would, I would approach. And that's just part of the growth of, of being an artist, I think. So, uh, speaking of shared worlds, I asked you recently about you know what would you think of uh, other authors sharing Sesquil Valley and its characters using them in their writings much like you know Lovecraft did and you said that was fine except you have a rule about you have one rule 
I have one rule, and that is that no one can portray the poet William Davis Manley, um, because I had an early, um, when I first started writing, someone wrote a story about William Davis Manley and how he vanished. And the fate they gave him was he became a giant mushroom on a, <laughs> on a stump in Sesco Valley. And I went, no, 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 girlfriend, hello. Um, <laughs> that completely would destroy the mystique of William Davis Manley. I never thought that I would portray him as a character, but I have started to do so. And in this next book, I hint all these weird little things that might be true about this poet. But I, I don't want any other, anyone else, I don't want other, other people portraying Manly. And my other rule was that there are no guns in Sesquiloe Valley, and yet, mm -hmm. and yet I, I think Jeffrey Thomas, Stanley C. Sargent, and someone else have written stories with guns in them. And then, so, you know, I'm not, the only real rule is don't, um, don't portray my characters. I, I guess that was what I would ask. If you're going to write about Sesquiloe Valley, invent your own characters. Mm -hmm. you know, don't use my characters. That would be my one request. Yeah. But, yeah, I've, uh, more on that later. Okay. Um, I think we got time for one more question. I think Willem has to go. Um, how, in your opinion, Mon this is a, yeah. uh, how, in your opinion, is modern horror, are modern horror stories by modern authors different from the ones that Lovecraft and his contemporaries wrote. And then, then I think we need to let Willem go after that one. Um, I, I don't know. Um, because for their time, I mean, Lovecraft was a completely contemporary writer. He, he was writing about the things that were happening at his time. He was writing about the science of his time, the the localities of his time, the people of his time, and so I don't think. And, and I, I see that I see people doing that now. They're writing, so I I think perhaps the only difference that I can see is the degree of of sexual situations, violence. Um, in Lovecraft's day, I don't think you would ever have a genre such as splatterpunk that would almost mm -hmm. celebrate the those aspects of writing. Hmm. So I don't, you know, it's, it, this is an impossible question for me to answer because we have so many different writers writing today, writing so the stories of Laird Barron could not possibly be mistaken for the stories of Caitlin Kiernan. Um, they're they're unique, and so I, I I think that's the important thing. If you're going to write today, you you try and be yourself as a writer. Um, even someone like me who's writing Lovecraftian weird fiction, I try to be completely myself. And I'm trying to write stories that are uniquely my own. Um, I think... So that's, that's the similarity. I mean, Robert Block, when he was writing in the 1930s, he was, he, he was writing stories that became, you know, the psychological horror stories. They, they were... They were Absolutely, Robert Block stories and H.P. Lovecraft. No one can write stories like H.P. Lovecraft. There will never be another H.P. Lovecraft because he was absolutely unique, and um, and there shouldn't be. I mean, I, I, I've I've corresponded with people who who have actually said, you know, they'd like to be the next H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> and I've always, I've always said, well, if you're going to be the next H.P. Lovecraft, 
your work has to be as unlike the work of H.P. Lovecraft as possible because you have to be unique in your own way. You cannot be unique in the way that Lovecraft was unique because then you are just a copy and a bit of a fraud. <laughs> so be yourself. Yeah, the things that, you know, I'll close this by saying that at first glance, you look at a man, H.P. Lovecraft, and you look at another man, W.H. Pugmire, and, and the first thought is, well, they could not be less alike. But, you know, the, the ideas of Lovecraft are what binds them, and the other thing that binds them that I admire about Lovecraft and Willem as a person is that being true to yourself and then the success will follow. And I think a lot of people love, I know that a lot of people love you, Willem, and, and your words and your books, and you know, well, we, want you. You to, we want you to keep writing. So, well, this, and that's what I have in common with Lovecraft is we both have a passion for our work. Mm -hmm. And um, if, I, if I share anything with H.P. Lovecraft, it is that artistic passion <laughs> and the goal to um, to to write the, as as well as I can and to express my soul with my fiction. Well, Lovecraft looks so conservative and stoic. I think Willem is what his soul must have looked like. You're like Lovecraft inside. What? I don't look stoic, <laughs> honey. Please. <laughs> I'm the most silly bitch I know, girlfriend. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Takes a lot of yeah. balls to walk around like this, baby, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. right. Maybe stoic was the wrong word. How about stayed? Okay. <laughs> Lovecraft was very stayed. This, this was delightful. I just, I love this so much. I love you all for uh, attending, and I love all the viewers who have been watching this and who will watch this. And I'm especially grateful to Mike and for for um, organizing this and for his excellent Lovecraft e-zine, which is truly phenomenal. It's a real gift. Yes. Um, I look forward to soon, I promise, Michael, sending you the new things that I will be <laughs> writing for you. Okay. So thank you well, very thank much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Will. Thanks for doing this, guys. We are going to do this. We are going to do this every Sunday at 5 p.m. Central, 11 p.m., London time, 3 p.m., see if I can remember all these Pacific, and it would be 6 Eastern. So if I didn't mention your time zone, you're not invited. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> if I didn't mention your time zone, you're going to have to look it up yourself. But we, this is going to be a very regular thing, and uh, thanks for joining us, Will. Really appreciate it. Right. So how do I turn it off? Do I just push exit? You just push exit. That's you all you do. The window. All right. <laughs> That's it. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to push the, the, the broadcast game. button. So. Goodbye, my darlings. I will see you in your dreams. Goodbye, Willem. <laughs> Take care. Thanks for having me, Mike. No problem. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. Appreciate it. Have a good it. one, guys. Take care.